hope everyone had a good afternoon today. We're going to be talking tonight about the individual that was prophesied there in the scripture reading. In 1 Kings chapter 13, you might just look over there just to, just to see it in the context. You could pick up a little bit uh, from the scripture reading where Blake read just a second ago. But to just look over there in 1 Kings chapter 13, 1 Kings chapter 13, and you look at the context, you might just look back at the tail end of chapter 11, is Solomon dying. His son comes to the throne, Rehoboam. And we know what happens pretty much right out of the gate with Rehoboam. You have the older counselors that served Solomon, and you have those who Rehoboam grew up with, the young the young men and the two, uh, he seeks counsel. The two parties give their counsel, and he chooses the wrong counsel. He chooses to the, he chooses to listen to those, the younger individuals. We know what comes from that: the kingdom splits. So this is where you have the divided kingdom. You have the prophecy in chapter thirteen. Okay, so you have Rehoboam, you have Jeroboam, the tail end of chapter 12, Jeroboam's golden calves. Then you have the prophecy naming Josiah. Now, when is Josiah going to come to the throne? And I'll tell you right now, sometimes I, I miss things, and I had, I had missed how much time pass, how much time is going to pass before Josiah who is named by name. And I always think in Scripture, it's always fascinating when God tells someone, you're going to name your child that. Well, here it's not even you're going to name your child that. It's a child is going to come named Josiah. Right? There's going to be someone named Josiah. It's over in 2 Kings chapter 22 is where Josiah finally comes to the throne. So we go from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 past all the kings pretty much and we come over to second kings chapter 22 and we have verse 1 second kings 22 verse 1 josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in jerusalem his mother's name was jedida the daughter of adiah of bosketh he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand to the, or to the left. And we are almost through. There's only a few more chapters in 2 Kings. So you go from the time of the, that the kingdom divides, and even as you think about the kingdom dividing, how many generations were there of kings, because the Lord didn't want them to have kings, how many generations were there before we get to the prophecy about Josiah? Okay, so you have the first one. You have Saul. Okay, you, so you go from Saul to David to Solomon to Rehoboam. And boom, we have the prophecy. So almost right out of the gate, 1 Kings 13, scholars who've gone through and calculated, it's about 300 years. 300 years from the time of the prophecy, naming him by name, Josiah. Can you imagine? And it just shows the awesome power of God. Someone in the 1700s naming, who should I pick on? Someone in the 1700s saying, Josh Bunch is going to be born in this year at this time. Because that's effectively what happened, 300 years. So it would be the equivalent of before the foundation of this country, someone calling Josh Bunch by name and saying this is what he's going to do, and being very specific about what he's going to do. That's what the Lord does with Josiah, and it's just an awesome, awesome picture. Can you imagine, here in chapter 22, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. What were you doing when you were eight years old? I remember what I was doing. At that time, I started school a little bit early because of my birth, because of my birthday. I was in fourth grade. I think I was still, I had the little kangaroo sneakers that you could put a little penny in, you know, stuff like that, a little dollar bill. Y'all remember the ruse? That's what I was doing when I was eight. Josiah was king at the tender age of eight. I just want to talk about him, and it's just an amazing, he's just an amazing character in Scripture. So let's just make a few simple points. One is this, age has almost nothing to do with obedience. And I have to say almost, because we're not talking about infants here. We're not talking about babies. 
But as we think about age, what is the age of accountability? You know, a lot of folks, there, there are a lot of folks who think the age of 12 is the age of accountability, and they talk about that like you see that age in Scripture as, you know, Moses came down from Sinai and said at the age of 12, that is, <laughs> you don't see that in Scripture. So the age of accountability is probably different for, for each individual, but I do know this, Josiah is young. He's real young. And even in his youth, he wants to do what is right in the sight of God. Even, even apparently, um, as we are introduced to him. So we, we just consider that age almost has nothing to do with obedience. How old was Joseph? Joseph is real young when we are introduced to him. I shouldn't say introduced because we read about his birth. But when he comes and when he's sold into, sold into bondage, he's real young. How old is Daniel when we read about Daniel? You know, and it just becomes sort of a, a character list of people in the, the Old Testament or the, or the New Testament. How old was Samuel when he was serving the Lord? Samuel's real young. And yet there he was doing what he could, serving, serving the Lord. Then, of course, you have Jesus, 12 years old. He's 12. When he tells his mother, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business, do you think that just started with her saying, where have you been at? No, he's, he's already grown, and he was already recognizing, even, even at the age of 12. How old's Josiah? He's eight. He's, he's an eight-year-old. That's what he is. And yet he is choosing to do what is right, in spite of his father. And that's the previous verses. Look, look a little bit earlier, chapter 21, verse 19. Amon was 22 years old when he became king. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth, the daughter of Heros of Jotba. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. He walked in all the ways that his father walked. He served the idols that his father had served and worshipped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers, did not walk in the way of the Lord. Then the servants of Ammon conspired against him and killed the king in his own house. But the people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. And then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Ammon which he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles, the kings of Judah, and he was buried in his tomb in the garden of Uzzah, then Josiah, his son, reigned in his place, and his son did what was right in spite of his father. His father did not do what was right. His father, Amon, was a wicked man. Josiah's grandfather was Manasseh. And Manasseh, he also did what was wicked. Earlier in chapter 21, we'll look at verse 11 says, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and also he made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies. Verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. That's Josiah's grandfather. But the interesting thing about Manasseh, because Manasseh, he was wicked. He's so wicked that his name becomes a byword for wickedness. That's how wicked Manasseh is. But something interesting happens. And it's talked about over in 2 Chronicles. So leave a marker here in 2 Kings. But come over to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. In 2 Chronicles 33, we have a detail towards the end of Manasseh's life that we don't have in 2 Kings. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33, at verse 10, as we think about age having almost nothing to do with obedience, how young is too young to love the Lord? Right? It's to just, to just consider that question. 
I don't think there's a hard and fast answer. How old is too old to obey the Lord? Manasseh. 2 Chronicles 33, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. After this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gion in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate, and it enclosed Ophel, and he raised it to a very great height. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. He took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mounts of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Here Manasseh is, and he had been as wicked as all get out. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord's still working on him, he gets hauled off to Babylon by hooks, and what does he do? He cries out to God. And God hears him. And when it's all said and done, Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather, is back in Jerusalem tearing down the idols that he himself had built. And he's building walls around the city because he knows what's coming in all likelihood. He's doing all this and he's commanding the people, commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Okay. So how old is too old to obey the Lord? What's interesting is this. Josiah comes to the throne when he's eight. Amon, we already read the passage, Amon reigned, Amon reigned when Manasseh died. Okay? And I, I wasn't sure how I would illustrate this, so I'm trying to do it as simple as I can because I was having trouble with the math. Josiah was eight. Amon reigned for two years. So how old was Josiah when his grandfather died? He was six. What do you think Josiah saw his grandfather doing in those last few years of his grandfather's life in those first few years of his own life? Those of you who have grandkids or great-grandkids, whatever it may be, do you like playing with your kids when they're, you know, three years old, four years old? Man, they start talking, whew, and all of a sudden it's a whole new ball game. Three, four, five years old. You start getting into that age and you, you start remembering what it was like for you. When Josiah was five, his grandfather was still alive. His father was also still alive. He was good, Josiah was good, in spite of what his father was doing. But Josiah, at least as a possibility, because the question is, how did Josiah get to be so good? It certainly wasn't because of Amon. I would suggest it certainly wasn't completely because of the word of the Lord. We're going to read here in a minute where they discover the word of God. I wonder if he did not learn some very valuable lessons from watching his grandfather. Not from Manasseh's wickedness that's going to become a byword, but when Manasseh repents and he comes back to Jerusalem. I wonder if you just think about what Josiah must have seen as, as a little boy. Just a possibility, regardless. Can the young obey the Lord? Can the old obey the Lord? That's Josiah, and that's Manasseh. Back to 2 Kings now. Back to 2 Kings 22, and the discovery of the book, the word of God enduring forever. 2 Kings 22, verse 3. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah. So time has gone by. He's not an 8-year-old anymore. 
The king sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work, those who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord, doing the work to repair the damages to the house, to carpenters, builders, masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand, because they deal faithfully. They were trustworthy, and Josiah was saying, just do it. I don't need to see receipts. <laughs> Just do it. This needs to be done. Do it. These men are trustworthy. Turn them loose. Verse 8, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work and oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest Achim, the son of Shaphan, Achbor, um, the son of Micaiah, Sha Shaphan, scribe, pardon me for hashing up all these names, and Uzziah, servant of the king, saying, Go inquire the, of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. We have found the book. Was the book new? Was the book new to them? <laughs> it was new to them, but it wasn't new. <laughs> it was sitting there. It was sitting there the whole time. You have the verse in the New Testament. All flesh is as grass. Grass withers. Grass withers, the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Nobody was reading God's word, but it was still there. It was still there. Just waiting for someone to pick it up and say, Josiah, we have found a book. And they read it in his presence, and he tore his clothes. Sometimes people will try to trace the church back throughout history. And they'll say, well, you don't read about the Church of Christ back in the Middle Ages. You don't read about the Church of Christ in the Dark Ages, and therefore the Church of Christ didn't exist back then. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. That's, that's up for debate. But in a way, it is much like Josiah in the book here. Could every single church go off into apostasy? Could every single church go off? Yeah, it could happen. <laughs> it could happen. Um, could it get down to where there's just eight people in the whole world who are going to be saved? Hey, it happened before. I guess it could happen again. Some people think that actually Judgment Day may be like that, that the world is given over to so much evil that that's when the Lord is going to say enough's enough. Um, whatever the case may be. But could every single church go off into apostasy? Yes. Could someone in that situation pick up a book the Bible that people had not picked up in hundreds of years, open the book, read it, obey the gospel, and be added to the Lord's church. Yes. Even though no one, even though no one had been reading it before it was discovered in the rubble, was it still the power of God unto salvation? Is it still the power of God unto salvation, regardless of whether or not people are reading it? People will try to trace the church back throughout history, and they're looking at the wrong thing. They need to be looking not at the church, but at the seed. Is the seed, and that's, I th that's why we've been having this class on Sunday morning, as we think about the seed. If you have the seed, how long can the seed remain dormant? The word of God endures forever. It can lay dormant for millennia, and someone could still discover it, 
pick it up, and if they can understand the words on the page, they can obey the words on the page, and they can be added to the church. It is the power of God unto salvation. There it was, sitting under the rubble, and it was enduring. Josiah hears it, and immediately, what does he do? He tears his clothes. And the Lord is going to recognize what Josiah has done. And it's just an impressive scene. And it just shows the power as we, as we look at the passage here. He's not even reading about the Messiah necessarily. <laughs> Maybe prophecies about the Messiah. <laughs> but he's reading the old law. We, on this side of the cross... As we have scripture, the faith which has once and for all been delivered to the saints, it behooves us to contend earnestly for it, recognizing what it is. It is the power of God unto salvation. There's a reason that Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And he knew full well, he knew full well it had not originated with him. The letters, as the Holy Spirit, as men were moved by the Holy Spirit and it was being written, Paul knew full well. I didn't learn it from men. It is as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. It has been revealed, and we contend earnestly for it. I actually just received a message this afternoon. Well, he may be, he may be watching this tonight online. I'll just share what he asked. Said it, he, had, he asked about the church. And I said, well, what questions do you have? And he was just inquiring on Facebook. He said, and his question was, he said, I want to know if y'all actually believe the Bible. I just want to know if you guys actually believe what the Bible says. He went on, and we, we went um, back and forth just a, just a hair, or at least within the same comment. He said he had been inquiring at other churches in town. And open parentheses, these are his words. What do you all actually believe about homosexuality? And he said, he said, him and his wife have feelings about it. And he says a lot of the churches in town says they're not really doing what the Bible says. He said, so what do you all actually believe about the Bible? It is refreshing to get that question. <laughs> it is refreshing to get someone who says, it's not about whether or not you have a gymnasium. It's not about how much money you have in the bank. It's not about what the facilities look, by, look like. It is, we have found a book. Are you guys actually going, are you actually going by the book? And to be able to say, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. Anything other than the Bible is not authorized by God. We don't go by traditions. We don't go by opinions. If you don't have, if you, if you don't have God's word behind it, then it, it just won't cut it. Josiah, as the man comes to him and says, we have found a book and reads it in the king's presence. The word of God endures forever. Here in chapter 22, let's read on. Verse 14, then Hilkiah the priest Ahikam, Achor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to hold of the prophetess. Wife Shulam went to all these people. Okay, verse 15. She said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. So we're talking about captivity. I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger um, with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, 
Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what was spoken against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I shall bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. God's judgment is individual in nature. I would suggest it always has been. Again, did God destroy the world with water? Yeah. Was he able to save Noah? God's judgment is individual in nature. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities of the plain? Yes. Was he able to save righteous Lot? God's judgment is individual. The devil comes before the Lord. The Lord says, what you been up to? Oh, going back and forth and hither and yon on the land. What's the Lord say? Have you considered my servant Job? He's dealing with individuals. On and on, all through Scripture. When you come up to the New Testament and you come to Revelation and you read about the church that the, the Bible publishers called the dead church, Sardis. Dead, right? Dead as a doornail. <laughs> dead. Sardis. The Lord says, you think you have your name? You don't have your name. You're dead. <laughs> but there were also those there who were dying. So there were those who were dead, and there were those who were dying. But then he says, there were also those even in Sardis who had not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me. The, is God's judgment individual in nature? I understand the Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved. But when we think about judgment, how do we look at it? God renders to each one according to their deeds. He renders to each one. When we stand before the Lord in judgment, and I think it's going to be, I don't think judgment day is going to be like the DMV, you know, where it's now calling number 348. I don't think judgment day is going to be like that. But will God deal with us individually at judgment? In a sense, yes. In a sense. Now, as God deals with individuals, does he look at those individuals and how they have related to others? Certainly. He looks, he looks at us individually, and he wants to see how we have treated others, both inside the church and outside the church. He wants to see how we relate to others inside the church and outside the church. And, and there are ample verses that talk about that. One is just Galatians. Do good unto all, especially the household of faith. The Lord wants to know if we're, we're going to do that. But still, all through Scripture, we have God's individual, God's judgment being individual. He says here, I'm going to bring the calamity on Judah. <laughs> This is going to happen. Captivity is going to happen. It's been prophesied, and that prophecy is going to be fulfilled. But is Josiah going to see it? He's not going to see it. The Lord, the word of the Lord that came that was brought back to him, the Lord said, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord. When you heard, when you heard what was spoken, the Lord says, I have heard you, says the Lord. I will gather you, and he would not see all the calamity that would come upon that would come upon the people. Even here, the individual was heard. The Pharisee and the tax collector. Maybe the ultimate example? Who went home justified? The individual. The tax collector went home justified. God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Josiah tears his clothes, tender-hearted. Let's look at what Josiah did in chapter 23. Chapter 23, and we won't read the whole chapter, but it's, it's an impressive chapter to see everything Josiah did. But in verse 1, Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Then the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah. With him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, 
the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments with all his heart, with all his soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book, and all the people took a stand for the covenant. Verse 5, he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense. Verse 6, he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it there to ashes, threw the ashes on the graves. Talks about it. Verse 8, he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense. That was prophesied to happen, by the way in the scripture reading that we read, come down to verse 10. He defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Kenem, that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Molech. He removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was in the court. He burned the chariots of the sun with fire. You remember in the New Testament when you have those Gentiles who were practice, practicing sorcery and all those things? You remember what they did with the books? They actually counted up the value of them. Not real sure why that's included in Scripture, but it, it was very valuable, and they burned the books right there. <laughs> they burned them. They, they knew if it wasn't good for them, it wasn't good for anybody else. Josiah, he's on the war path is what he is, and he's going through and he's cleaning house. Verse 13, the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem. Verse 14, he broke in pieces the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, filled their places with the bones of men. The altar at Bethel in the high place, verse 15, in which Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, 300 years before this, made Israel sin and made both that altar and the high place. He broke down and burned the high place, crushed it to powder and burned the woman the wooden image. Then Josiah turns and he sees the tombs that were there on the mountain and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord which the Son of God proclaimed, which proclaimed these words. Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone. You don't say. You know why? Because that guy was the one who 300 years ago said, There's going to come someone named Josiah. <laughs> That's the prophet. And Josiah says, Leave those alone. He was a good fella, and he had prophesied the word of God. Let him alone. Let no one move his bones. Verse 18, so they let his bones alone. Verse 19, Josiah took away all the shrines of the high places. Verse 20, he executed all the priests of the high places. Verse 21, the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as is written in this book of the covenant. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spirits, spiritists, the household gods, the idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now before him there is no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the, all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. How much did Josiah do? <laughs> not saying he's eight years old at this point, but he's not that old. And he is cleaning house. He is absolutely cleaning house. And it is an amazing picture of zeal and faith and obedience and a love for the Lord. Remember what the disciples remember when Jesus cleanses the temple? <laughs> it seems like one of the places it actually says afterwards they remembered. Zeal for thy house has eaten me up. I think as it was for Jesus, I think you could say the same thing about Josiah. Zeal for the Lord's house had eaten him up. And he is going through and he is doing amazing things. And yet what happened? 
everything we just read, or at least went over quickly. You would think, before reading these verses, you would think the next verse would say, and the Lord turned away from his wrath. You would think it would say, and the Lord listened to Josiah's pleading, <laughs> and the calamity did not come upon Judah. But that's not what it says. Verse 26, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, with which his anger had aroused, was aroused against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him, even though Manasseh had also repented. Verse 27, And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, My name shall be there. Even after Josiah did all that, everything Josiah did was still not enough. It just wasn't enough. Now, that amazes me. That absolutely amazes me. And what it does is it makes me recognize the need for the Messiah and his sacrifice. If everything that Josiah did was not enough, if everything that Josiah did was not enough, then what is it going to take for the father to be satisfied? Josiah did all this, and yet, nevertheless, God doesn't, is not going to turn away from his wrath. It was going to happen. If, if everything Josiah did, if that could not satisfy the father, we come up to Romans 3. What else could satisfy God? If, if even after everything Josiah did, in Romans chapter 3, everything Josiah did, and the Lord's wrath would still burn. Romans chapter 3, at verse 21, and then the lesson is yours. Romans 3 verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God Pardon me. The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Previous chapters, Jews and Gentiles, there is no difference. For all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? Didn't. So does that mean Noah was not looking forward to the Messiah? Did Noah still need the Messiah just as much as anybody else? Father Abraham, the father of the faithful, as he's called in Scripture, what is it going to take to save even Abraham? It's going to take the Messiah. That's what it's going to take. And you just go through all the heroes of faith. Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, David, the man after God's own heart. What is it going to take for them to be saved? What does it take for even the righteous to be saved? You know that verse in Scripture when it talks about for scarcely is a righteous man saved, that it, the idea of that passage is what does it take for even the righteous to be saved? What does it take for even David to be saved? Even Abraham, even Noah, and even Josiah. What is it going to take for Josiah to be saved? Is Josiah going to be saved by works or by the grace of God that has appeared to all men? Jesus. It's going to take the Messiah. Verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. We've spoken recently, both me and others have spoken recently, recently about the propitiation, the satisfaction. Everything that Josiah did, was it enough to turn away God's wrath? 
No. When Jesus went to the cross, was that enough to turn away God's wrath? Whom God set forth as a propitiation. He will see it and his soul will be satisfied. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. The lesson is yours this evening. As we think about Josiah and we think about our points, we think about the word of God, and we think about doing the right thing regardless of how old we are whether we are young or old, for those who know to do good, if they don't do it, it's sin. <laughs> so if you're here this evening and you know what you need to do and you have not done it yet, take advantage of the Lord's invitation and obey the gospel. Become a Christian. If you're not a Christian, putting on Christ in baptism, like we spoke about this morning. If you are a Christian, but if you've been unfaithful, when Josiah heard the word of the Lord, he tore his clothes and he recognized we have not been doing what is right. And he repented. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we sing.